You should have watched a video on your own device by now, and you should be in your group meeting rooms answering inquiry questions for set one. So again, we're going to all have the same mass data. And then use the mass data. For the sets of two pennies through 40 pennies. To answer inquiry set one questions.
Okay, we're all, or most of us anyway, are back in the general room at this time. So let's go ahead and take a look at the data we all should have collected for the masses of the different sets of pennies. And so now we're ready to take a look at the set one inquiry questions. And I've set the whiteboard so that anyone can respond to questions um, A, B, and C. We'll do those first. And so question A, we see that from our data, the one penny that we weighed, weighed 2.49 grams. And then we weighed two pennies. And the two pennies was 4.99 grams. And so inquiry set question one, letter A, asks, can we use the mass that we recorded when we weighed two pennies to determine the mass of one penny? If so, what is the mass of one penny from the data that we collected for the mass of two pennies. We call this an average mass since we are averaging the masses of two pennies. So what should be our answer to question A? Someone go on the whiteboard and answer that question. Can we use the mass of two pennies to determine the mass of one penny? Yes or no? And then if so, what is this mass? What is this average mass of one penny? based on the mass of two pennies. And then repeat this same question for parts B and C for five pennies and for 10 pennies. So anyone can go ahead and use the whiteboard. What you do is just click on whatever pen color you want to use and then just write. Use your mouse to simply write. So A, the correct answer is yes. We can use the mass amount that we uh, determined for two pennies to determine the average mass of one penny. And so the mass of two pennies is 4.99 grams. And what we do to get the average is just divide that by two. And so we noticed 2.49 grams. That number has two decimal places. So when we divide 4.99 by 2, we'll round our final answer to two decimal places. And so the answers to B and C and 
A and D will all be yes. We can do the same for the masses of 5, 10, 20, and also 40 pennies. And we do the same technique that we did for part A. Take the mass of that set number of pennies and divide by those number of pennies to get the average mass for one penny. So for part B, we use the mass of five pennies. Which is 12.48 grams. And we divide by five. And then for part C, the mass of 10 pennies divided by 10. And then for part D, 20 pennies, their mass was 50.63. We'll divide that by 20. And then for part E, we take the mass of 40 pennies, which was 98.20 grams, and divide by 40. And that will give us the average mass of one penny for each of these sets of pennies, two through 40. At what point, like, like how far away from the original mass when we actually weigh just one penny like where do you draw the line of how far away from it the actual mass of one penny like you like how far like because when i see 2.53 grams um like when we take the mass of 20 pennies mm -hmm. The total mass and we divide by 20 and we get our number and then we round it to two decimal places and we mm -hmm. get 2.53 that um is still it's i mean it's a small number difference but where do you draw the line where you would answer no you wouldn't okay think about it The first penny I weighed could have been made in, in 2016 by operator number A on this particular machine at this particular mint somewhere in the United States. Every penny is not the same. Every penny is manufactured, maybe manufactured on different days, um, using different machines to manufacture those pennies, operated by different operators. So each penny is going to be different. One penny may have a little bit of debris on it that's added to the mass. You see what I'm saying? One penny yeah. may be old where one is all shiny and new. So each penny is going to be different. There's not going to be one penny that's going to weigh exactly the same. So okay. therefore, that's why we're getting an average mass of a penny. Okay. Because we don't expect each penny to be identical. Okay. And so that's the whole point of getting an average. When you're collecting scientific data, that's why when you're doing a certain experiment or technique, it's important to do more than one trial. And therefore, most standard procedures uh, suggest that you do at least three trials of the same step of an experiment, because that way you've got three different numbers, and therefore you get the average of that number. And that will make you as accurate, more accurate than just doing the experiment once and getting just one number. Because yeah, you've got a whole lot of room for error when you do an experiment 
We're humans. We're not perfect. Equipment and technology definitely is not perfect all the time. So therefore, by having more than one trial, you account for some of that error and you get an average. OK, and so the same concept here, because every penny is not going to be the same. So therefore, we're going to get an average mass of one penny. OK, so okay, thank you. very good. Very good question. So for B, what was our average for B? Anyone? For was it 2.50? Yes, ma'am. And what about C? C was 250 as well. I got 2.49 for C. Oh, that, yes, but you, we wouldn't round that up because the number next to it is a four. So whenever the number next to a number that needs to either stay the same or be rounded up is less than five, you keep it the same. So this one's 2.49. And then D was 2.53, correct? And what about right. E? What about E? Uh, I got 2.46. OK. Everyone agree with that one? Yes. OK. So now we've got all these averages for the different sets. And so back to, and I'm sorry, who, who, who asked me that first question? How far away do we need to think about these numbers being from each other? Which was another good question, by the way. Uh, Laura. Who, Laura. Okay. okay, so Laura, let's continue with that question that you asked. If we want to figure out, well, which one of these averages is the best average mass for one penny? And we may want to ask, well, how good is that old balance that I used in our laboratory? Okay. And also, how good is the machines that make our pennies? Okay, so our balance, the machines that make the pennies, the, the people operating the machines that make the pennies, um, all of that uh, gives some room for error. And also, are the pennies perfectly clean? Is there debris stuck onto any of the pennies that may have added to the weight in any way? Or were the pennies chipped or uh, degraded in any kind of way that could have made the mass a little bit less than it should have been? And so when you want to know how close are our numbers to each other, our first set with the two pennies, 2.50. The second set with five pennies is 2.50. Those numbers don't deviate from each other at all because they're the same. But then when we get down to the larger sets, 10 through 40, we start seeing some different averages, 2.49, 2.53, and 2.46. So you want to ask yourself, how precise is our data? So do our averages deviate from each other significantly? No. I agree with your answer. No, they do not. And so in order to prove that, you can calculate what's called the average of the averages. So you take these five averages, add them together, let's all do that, and then divide by five.
And so the average of these five averages is 2.50. And so we can do another table. And we notice that the set of two and five pennies have a zero deviation from the average of the averages. The average of the averages is 2.50. To get the deviation, you take your average and subtract it from the average of the averages. And so we get zero for both the set of two pennies and the set of five pennies because their average is identical to the average of the averages. But then when we go to the set of 10 pennies, we get 2.50 minus 2.49, and that's a deviation, a very small deviation of 0.01. And then the 20 pennies, 2.53 minus 2.50 is a deviation of 0.03. And then the last one, 2.50 minus 2.46 is 0.04. So the deviations are very small, as well as zero deviation for those lower set numbered sets. So the deviations are very small. And whenever your deviations are very small, that means our data is very precise. So to answer the data set inquiry question for set one, part F, are these numbers exactly the same? Well, for the set of two pennies and five pennies, yes, they were the same. They were both 2.50. But for the set of 10, 20, and 40 pennies, they were different. And then are they close to each other? Yes. You can say, yes, they are very close. The deviations between the numbers, between the averages is very small, like we showed here in this data table. Very small deviations. And then G, which of these values 2.50, 2.49, 2.53, or 2.46, do you think is the best mass of one penny? Which one of these averages is the best average for the mass of one penny? And why did you choose what you chose? Anyone? Which one of these averages is the best average mass for um, one penny? I said 10.50 because wow. not only is it seen the most during the averages, but it is also the average of all averages. Okay, that's a, that's a logical uh, answer. Does anyone have a different answer? Uh, I said 2.46 because it's the mat or the average of the largest group. Very good. I agree with you. 2.46 grams is going to be our best average mass for one penny because it's the one obtained from the 40 pennies set. And that's our largest data set. So for part G, it's going to be the 2.46 grams. 
because that's the average mass obtained from our largest data set, the 40 pennies. Any questions about step one? Inquiry questions. OK, so for step 15, right now my iPad is not responding. But make sure you put for step 15. 2.46 grams. On your data table as your best mass. Of one penny. I'm sorry, could you say that again? So on your data sheet. For step 15. And I can't point it out because my iPad is not responding right now. But where it says step 15 best mass of one penny. We just answered that question in question G of the set one inquiry questions. And we decided that the best mass of one penny is 2.46 grams. So make sure you write that on your data sheet for step 15. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we're ready to move on to inquiry questions for set two. And so to access the video, Go to your eLearn. And you're now ready to watch the Penny Lab Inquiry Set 2 video. After you watch that video, then go to your group rooms. And then you're going to answer Inquiry Set 2 questions. Questions H through P.
So the inquiry set two videos about nine to 10 minutes long, and it should take you another 10 minutes or so to answer set two inquiry questions. So I expect you will be ready to return to the general room between 10.15 and 10.20.
I see that most of you have returned to the general room. So let's go ahead and talk about inquiry set two questions H through P. So question H, would you use the graduated cylinder to measure volumes for liquids or solids? And then give an explanation for your answer. So how did we answer this one? Anyone want to share their answer? Um, I said liquids because it's measure it measures volume in middle milliliters. So liquids and answer your question why based on the definition of a liquid. So liquids can be measured why? What will liquids do? in relationship to the graduated cylinder. It takes the shape of the cylinder. Very good. So we know that liquids will take on the shape of the container that they're put in, in this case, the graduated cylinder. But at the same time, it's going to maintain that same volume that it had before it was poured into the graduated cylinder. So you can use the cylinder's markings to determine how much liquid you have. Would you ever want to use a graduated cylinder to determine the volume of a solid? Yes. Elaborate on that, Cameron. If the solid is small enough to fit inside the graduated cylinder, you can use uh, displacement to measure the volume. Very good. So solids can be measured in the graduated cylinder using the displacement method. And why do I have to use this special water displacement method? Uh, if I have a certain amount of water, I can just pour the water in the graduated cylinder, use the graduated cylinder's markings to determine the volume of water that I've poured in the cylinder because that water is going to take on the shape of the cylinder. But if I've got 40 pennies, and I want to determine what's the volume of this 40 pennies, I've already determined the the mass of 40 pennies. Why can't I just throw those 40 pennies in the cylinder and determine the volume? Without by walking, just, just go by ahead. Them, by themselves, um, they would not fill or take the sh shape of the container like. Very good. Yeah. Right, solids have their own shape. They will not take on the shape of the container. So therefore you can't measure the volume of a solid by simply putting the solids directly into the graduated cylinder because they're going to maintain their own shape. And like you said, they're not going to fill the volume or take on the volume of the cylinder. So therefore, you have to use the water displacement method when determining the volume of solids. And the water displacement method is particularly useful in determining the volume of irregular shaped solids. Now, a penny has a regular shape. 
it's circular or spherical. So therefore, there's a geometric formula that we can use to determine the volume of something that is round or circular. I think the formula is pi times the radius cubed or something like that. But an irregular shaped solid like a rock that's not perfectly round, that may have some jagged edges. Um, and so therefore, it's not a perfectly round circle. We can't use the geometric formula like pi times radius raised to the third power to determine the volume. But the displacement method can be used to determine the volume of an irregular shaped object like a rock. OK. Any questions about question H? So the answer to that one is both. We can use the graduated cylinder to measure the volume of both liquids and solids. But for solids, you have to use the water displacement method. You can't put the solid directly in the graduated cylinder and determine its volume. So the graduated cylinder you saw in the video, how many milliliters can be accurately measured in that graduated cylinder? What capacity was the graduated cylinder in the video? 100 milliliters. Very good. And we're going to put a decimal and we'll put at least one zero digit decimal place in our answer. And so your graduated cylinder that you saw in the video had the little markings, the little lines on it. What does each line or marking represent? How many milliliters? One point zero. Very good. So if we had a level of liquid like in this picture, where the level of the liquid was between two markings. So in this picture, the level of the liquid is between 24 and 25. So if the level of liquid is between two marks, how would you record the volume? Would you do it like 24.5 or 24.8? Very good. So it's going to include a decimal number. It's not going to be. For example. This picture here. It won't be 24.0 or 25.0, but it's going to be somewhere in between. So we're going to have to estimate use an estimate that includes a decimal number. That's an actual number. So we can say a non-zero decimal number. And when I say estimate, that's exactly what it is. Because depending on the person doing the measuring, one person's eyesight may be better than another person's eyesight. So therefore, you may uh, read a value Let's say we have this graduated cylinder and we've got this much liquid. And let's say this is. Twenty four, twenty three. And so therefore we would need to estimate. I may say that this is twenty four point two milliliters. You may say it's twenty four point three milliliters. It just depends on the person that's doing the reading. And so. 
we would estimate the volume between those two marking lines. And for this example here, it's somewhere between 24 and 25 milliliters. So we're going to have to use a non-zero decimal number to do that estimate of that volume. So you're going to use an estimate that includes a non-zero decimal number at the end of the reading. And so you notice when I drew my level of liquid that I drew a curvature at the top representing the top level of the liquid. That's called a meniscus. So that little curvature at the surface of the liquid is called a meniscus. So we will almost always see a meniscus, a meniscus as indicated in my little drawing there, as well as the picture on the data sheet. In our 100 mil graduated cylinder, which you saw in the video, it's going to be somewhat difficult to see the curve. But as you go to smaller and smaller diam diameter graduated cylinders, like the 10 milliliter graduated cylinder especially, you can really, really see that curvature at the top surface of the liquid. And so whenever you're reading a graduated cylinder, you're always to get eye level with that bottom curvature or meniscus at the top of the surface of the liquid. So based on this picture that we see on the right, what would you say the value for the volume in this graduated cylinder here? So again, we know it's somewhere between 24 and 25. So now we need to make an estimate. So what did you say the volume of the liquid in the cylinder? 24.5 milliliters. That's a very good estimate. Somebody else may say 24.6 or 24.7, but either of those would be very good estimates as of the volume of liquid in the cylinder. So anywhere, if you estimate anywhere between 24.5 and 24.7 milliliters, I say that's a very good estimate. And we've kind of already answered question M, haven't we? We've already talked about the displacement method. And if we wanted to measure the volume of pennies, we can't just put the pennies in the cylinder and read the volume because pennies are solids. and they do not take on the shape of the cylinder. Any questions about M? For question N, if we filled our graduated cylinder that we saw in the video, all the way to the top until it was almost, but not overflowing, but almost overflowing. And then if we added some pennies to the cylinder, what would happen to the water? Just think about in general, if you put uh, some water in a glass in your kitchen and you fill that glass almost to the overflowing point, and then you drop a couple of cubes of ice in that cup, what would happen to the water? It would fill it to the top or almost overflow. Right, the water would spill out or overflow. Not all of the water, but some of the water, right?
So we said some of our water would spill out if we had that cylinder filled all the way to the top and then added some pennies to it. Well, how much water would spill out? An amount equal to the volume of the pennies. Very good. And then question P, a good way to determine the volume of a solid object or objects is to use the water displacement method. So the water displacement method is going to measure the amount of water that that object displaces, which is going to be the exact volume of the object itself. So it will require that you measure the volume of some water in a graduated cylinder to be your initial volume. And then you're going to put your penny or pennies in the water, and then you're going to record the final volume of the water in the cylinder. And then if you subtract the final volume of the water in the cylinder from the initial volume of water in the cylinder, that difference is going to be equal to the volume of that object. So in the videos and or pictures that you're about to watch, I have a graduated cylinder filled with water to the 45.0 milliliter mark. This is the initial volume of water in the cylinder. And then I add one penny. 